The world of Western art is booming. Whether you're looking for the gritty early photography of L.A. Huffman and Alexander Gardner, or the paintings from Tao School to Terpening, or even the classic bronze sculptures and, and other works, of course, by Remington and Russell, the results are hard to miss. Thomas Moran's landscapes have commanded over $17 million for a single piece, and juggernauts like Frederick Remington and Charles Russell can regularly bring over $5 million. But it wasn't always this way. For a time, Western art was overshadowed and, and even poo-pooed a bit by 20th century modernism, and perhaps in part due to its place in popular culture. But over the last decade, there has been a dramatic shift in the acceptance, the popularity, and the prices of Western art. And why shouldn't there be? The, the genre's appeal is as vast as its signature landscapes. It has the romance, the, the watercolors, the photography, the wildlife, oils, sculpture, and, and the subject matter. Uh, Native Americans, cowboys, horses, bison, mountains, sunsets, prairies, plains, and the purity of the American West, or even sometimes mourning its transition and loss. Of course, no discussion of Western art is complete without the mention of Zane Gray. The once aspiring dentist and professional baseball player would rise to become one of the greatest storytellers of the American West. He submitted several rejected works in the early 20th century before Heritage of the Desert became a bestseller in 1910, followed by the genre-defining Riders of the Purple Sage in 1912. Now, Sage would be cited as many as defining the Western genre of literature and become the most popular Western novel of all time. He is the greatest and most prolific storyteller of the American West. Such glowing success allowed Gray to pursue what he loved most, the outdoors in the American West. As prolific an outdoorsman as he was a storyteller, Gray spent copious amounts of time outdoors. For 14 years, he filled the pages of Outdoor Life magazine, becoming a celebrity contributor, and helped popularize big game fishing. But he didn't, he didn't just popularize it, he revolutionized it. He wrote about it, traveled extensively around the globe for it, setting numerous world records along the way. His love for hunting was also well known, even being guided on an elk hunt by noted handgunner, hunter, author, and wildcatter, Elmer Keith. It's no coincidence that in the early 20th century, in Gray's writing prime, as well as the high point in American Western art, then in 1915, we introduced yet another great American artist to this conversation. And that artist is none other than John Ulrich. Now, John Ulrich's career doesn't begin in 1915. In fact, he began work for Winchester as far back as 1868. But 1915 was the year he created what is arguably his masterpiece, this stunning Winchester 1895. Ulrich has expertly covered it in delicate number one engraving, Winchester's costliest option. The bear, mountain lion, and deer that Gray hunted are emblazoned on the receiver in solid gold, one of extremely few Winchester 1895s to see this level of embellishment. It's such high embellishment that even the magazine is engraved, a feature that the Winchester catalog at the time specifically mentions as not offered. Winchester author George Mattis notes that the most, only the most expensive and deluxe engraving jobs could expect to see a small amount of engraving on the hammer. This 95 not only has engraving on the hammer, it's also graced by gold inlaid borders. To match, this extraordinary 95 wears high grade, piano polish walnut stocks deftly carved with the perfectly executed style B vine and floral Winchester design. And when it was finished, it cost more than 10 times a standard Winchester 1895. So while Ulrich may have retired from full-time factory work in 1907 from Winchester, his best work was far from behind him. He was so proud of this 1895 he placed his initials upon it. 
at a time when Western art was thriving. Its best storyteller was ordering a rifle from the definitive American rifle maker, embellished with art from one of America's preeminent master engravers. If this era needed a representative example or an exclamation point, this is it. For all the reasons we've just discussed, this is a genre crossing and a genre defying object. It's a high condition, deluxe Winchester at the top of its genre. It's also the end of Winchester's lever action era, coinciding with the end of the untamed West. It's an exceptional, superbly attractive art object of the American West, and it was crafted for the best-selling Western author of all time. Yet for all those intersections, the most exciting one may be that of its value. If you recall, Western art is recently receiving its justly deserved recognition and its prices are gaining ground on its art world contemporaries. And if you're a subscriber to this channel, you're certainly no stranger to the lengthy trend of unprecedented prices in the world of fine and collector firearms. The Winchester 1895 of Zane Gray is a truly special confluence of a, of a golden hour in Western art and of two artists at the top of their fields. And of course, of the two genres of Western art and fine arms, both of which are growing as quickly in value as they are in popularity. For a rifle where similar examples are housed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, this is a tremendous and beautiful opportunity for the savvy collector who understands that all these things are somehow embodied in one spectacular rifle. A living testament in gold and steel to the enchantment and timeless allure of the American West.